Postural, orthostatic, tachycardia. Tachycardia is a high heart rate, a sped up heart rate. All right? So it's a form of dysautonomia, which means it's a disorder of the autonomic nervous system. It's characterized by either having sustained tachycardia, so meaning a high elevated heart rate when you're you know, out and about, greater than 100 beats per minute. Normal resting heart rate for an adult is 72. So if you're up above 100 at a sustained heart rate, that's considered postural orthostatic hypotension. Orthostatic means pos like position. So from supine, laying on your back, to standing, that's a change in position. So that's orthostatic, okay? There's three, uh, three clinical subtypes. There's hypovolemic, meaning you have low blood volume, right? If you don't have enough blood volume and you stand up and the blood pools down, your heart has to speed up to try and, try and get enough blood flow to your brain so you don't go unconscious. So there's hypovolemic. There's neuropathic, which is um, you have a, a sympathetic dilation of blood vessels in the lower limbs, um, which causes, again, blood to pool. And then number three is hyperadrenergic, which is related to your adrenal system. Overactivation of the adrenal system, creating elevated heart rate, postural orthostatic hypotension. So you have a development of excess plasma norepinephrine on standing, leading to a profound sympathetic activity. Now, presence, or sorry, prevalence, one, it's between one million and three million Americans suffer from POTS. Uh, the symptoms could be dizziness, lightheadedness upon standing, vertigo, headaches, nauseousness, reduced mental clarity, a swimming or rocking sensation, and generalized fatigue, which sounds a hell of a lot like post-concussion syndrome. So then it becomes difficult again. What are we looking at? Maybe this person just has POTS. Let's rule it out. How are we going to rule it out? So the diagnostic criteria for an adolescent, meaning, meaning between 12 and 19 years of age, it's typically when you might start to see it, uh, particularly in females. 12 to 19 year olds, if you have a heart rate increase, and the way that you measure this is from supine, lying on your back, quiet resting heart rate for two to five minutes, take the heart rate, then you stand. If there is an increase in your heart rate, by greater than 40 beats per minute, um, or if you have a sustained orthostatic, meaning standing heart rate of greater than 120 beats per minute, okay, that is looking a lot like POTS, and or you could have a change in blood pressure uh, by from supine to standing by 20 uh, millimeters of mercury on the systolic and an increase of 10 millimeters per mercury on the diastolic from supine to sitting. So you have elevated heart rate, elevated blood, blood pressure. If you're 19 years or older, or sorry, 19, uh, over 19, you have a heart rate, everything else is the same except the heart rate increase, instead of being a 40 beat jump, it's actually uh, only a 30 beat jump. So from supine to standing, you have an increase in your heart rate of 30 beats per minute or greater. So that's for 19 and up, okay? I've had a few patients with this, with concussion injuries, and they've all been adolescent females, actually. But the way that I picked it up is we're going to do a treadmill test, and you know their heart rate is you know resting, normal, they're fine, and then all of a sudden they stand up and their heart rate jumps to 130. And you're like, oh, okay. Um, so now you have to start looking at it and start doing testing where you're doing supine to standing and that type of thing, looking at blood pressure, looking at heart rate. Um, and ultimately, the management for this, like you have to look at a lot of different things, not just heart rate, blood pressure, um, to kind of arrive at this diagnosis. But the management for this generally is referring the patient back to their family physician for further testing um, and to really look at you know, all the potential causes of what's going on, right? Is it adrenal, is it hypovolemic, um, or is it neur uh, neurologic? The initial management generally for POTS is trying to increase venous return back to the heart. So things like increasing uh, blood volume through increased fluid intake, increasing blood pressure through increased sodium intake, and again, this is all after or during, you know, you have, you have the patient's family doctor back involved and additional testing going on. Um, wearing compression stockings to help with venous return coming back to the heart. So compression stockings on the lower limbs to help drive blood back to, again, increase peripheral resistance to get that blood going back. Um, and there's potentially some pharmacological medications that may be able to be taken to help with this. 
And there's also increasing evidence for the use of cardiovascular exercise. It's progressive training. So this is the way that you know a PT or a chiro or something can get involved with the management of somebody with POTS is progressive exercise training in conjunction with their primary healthcare provider. I'm gonna go into a little bit on how to do this. I'm not gonna cover all of it. Uh, we cover all of it in our, in our, in our, in our full training course. Um, but generally what you have to do is you have to find out what their safe kind of rate is and then what their starting base rate is. And it's all based on heart rate, it's based on their resting heart rate, it's based on um, their age, it's based on their max heart rate, and then you do some calculations and you arrive at what's called their maximum steady state or their MSS. Then you take a percentage of their MSS and it's usually 75 to 85% and then you gradually introduce cardiovascular exercise at that level. Once they're able to achieve that level without having increased symptoms, you can then increase that gradually over time. But this might take months to get there. It's very potentially slow for a lot of people. So it takes a lot of work to try and get this to resolve. And again, co-managed with some other healthcare professionals and some other modalities to try and get it to work. Um, so once you figure out what their optimal training level is, then you have to figure out what exercise is going to be most beneficial. This creates problems for us as concussion clinicians when we're trying to use increased exercise and exertion to try and help reduce post-concussion symptoms. And you have somebody with POTS where it's they can only train to a certain level and it kind of clouds things a little bit. And then what kind of exercise prescription do you give them? So the general kind of rule of thumb is that exercise should be started in either seated or supine as much as possible. So rather than upright stationary biking or walking on a treadmill, you'd be doing things like maybe looking at the rowing machine or maybe doing um, a recumbent or a seated bike um, to try and try and get you know some exercise going, particular heart rate while not you know getting the um, the orthostatic side of things you know elevated. Okay, so it's a progressive thing. Uh, anyone who wants to look further on this, you can dig into some of the literature around it and things you can do. Um, so that is basically all I have to say about POTS is that the there is some evidence to show that exercise therapy can be beneficial. Uh, there's a lot of other things that should be looked at and ruled out, so make sure you're co-managing this um, with, with the primary care provider. Um, and it may take some time, so just from managing patient expectations, uh, there might be a lot that has to go into it.